All right, perfect. Can you guys hear me? Um, yeah, hello everyone. Um, super stoked to be here today in my home city, Berlin, um, to talk about Appium for couch potatoes. And even though there's Appium in the title of the talk, we weren't going to talk about mobile automation at all. We want to enter the TV space, right? And um, yeah, before, but before we go into the HPV stuff and how you can build apps for the TV, we will set some vocabulary straight and we will go back in time and see how Selenium and WebDriver has started and how it has become what it is, um, what it is today. Um, to understand how we can build a driver that probably will work on all web environments, um, maybe on a refrigerator, if that will support in, um, web environments anytime soon. Um, but yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm Christian. Uh, I work for a company called Source Labs. Um, I do a lot of open source stuff. Uh, you might uh, know me uh, as a maintainer of WebDriver.io um, and all sorts of stuff, uh, mainly test automation. The whole research on the topic uh, was made in collaboration with the Fraunhofer Focus. Um, they have an office here in Berlin, and they do a lot of research on HPV TV. The standard um, on how you build apps for smart TVs is, is pretty new. Um, newer than Selenium itself. And um, they do a lot of research. They work with a lot of companies for broadcasters that um, uh, provide HPV TVs. And uh, I was looking for a master thesis, and they, they needed a test automation driver um, and a development um, framework um, for, for their apps. Uh, so I went in there. I got it, basically a job and wrote my master thesis there. But yeah, before we go into that, let's, let's recap. Let's look what Selenium is. Many people that start with Selenium are pretty, pretty confused about it because there's so much going on. You test from your CSS property for over a browser that is doing requests to a backend server that is connected to a MySQL server. And all these components are really fragile and can fail really often. Um, another reason why many people are annoyed using end-to-end uh, -end tests or writing end-to-end -end tests there are just so many, so many frameworks and stuff you have to set up in order to run it. With a unit test framework, right? you, you just download the framework and you have your unit test code pieces um, that you can run. It's super simple. With end-to-end -end testing, it is, it is not simple at all. Um, it boils down, though, to, to three different areas, which is the client that speaks WebDriver, the WebDriver protocol. Um, you have a driver that can understand the WebDriver protocol and does some magic on the target environment. And of course, the target environment, which can be a browser, a mobile, um, mobile phone, uh, or a smart TV. Let's, let's um, make an example for Chrome. Let's say we want to automate Chrome and we use our favorite uh, framework, which is WebDriver.io. And um, we, we would need to download like, this jar file to, to run it. And not even that. Um, if people would just run this setup, it wouldn't work. You need additional Chrome driver. So there are four different things that you need to set up only to, to run one single browser automation. Um, to, to understand why this is and how it is uh, today, um, we need to go a little bit back in time. Um, when this guy, Jason Huggins, um, founder of Source Labs, um, when he introduced Selenium at the GTAC conference in London, um, and Back in the day, Selenium was not more than a JavaScript library, really. Um, the way it worked was you had your test page, you had, a, you had your server that you had to deploy, um, and it would has a test runner HTML that you would you go to with your browser. And it would have the test to page on the lower frame and your test on the upper frame written in HTML. And what the framework would do is it would pass the HTML, would read what you want to do, and it would then go using the frame, like going to the, into the frame and emulate everything with JavaScript. Um, the reason why tests were written in HTML um, in the first place was that Jason had the idea that he wanted to have a, um, executable documentation. Um, also, it was inspired by a framework called FIT. But yeah, the main, the main approach here was that he um, emulated everything with JavaScript. Um, then one year later, oh yeah, um, Funny, way, uh, funny story. Um, usually, sometimes video, uh, YouTube comments are way funnier than the um, video itself. And if you go on the first comment, you will see, damn, this is boring me to tears. Uh, I should look for a new job. And so you can see this, this stuff was really exciting in the first place. Um, but yeah, one year later, 
this guy came around, um, Simon Stewart, and he uh, showed a tool that was called WebDriver. And WebDriver had a kind of different approach to automate things. Um, it, used, it used the more native um, um, way. Um, for Firefox, for instance, they had a Firefox extension, and they would um, use the Telnet interface uh, to, to go to an URL and do stuff. For Internet Explorer, I think it was a com interface that they used. Um, but yeah, this is the, way, the more native approach. Um, yeah, you have, so you have Selenium and you have WebDriver. One is doing automation with JavaScript, and the other one is doing automation on a more native level. <clears throat> oh no, I have no internet. Sheet. I'm gonna. Uh, can you someone say the password? All right, let's go on. There we go. So when I talk about a native, a native approach, let's have an example and look at how Chrome is automating uh, the browser today. And it uses the Chrome DevTools protocol. Uh, you might have heard of, uh, about it. Um, it has a set of domains. If you go to one of these domains, you, you see it comes with a, with a handful of uh, commands like enable which is important if you want to use this domain. Um, and then you can use a variety of commands that would allow you to speak to the browser engine itself. Um, uh, you can also listen to, to a lot of events that are going on. And what Chrome Driver is doing is it uh, runs Chrome um, and attaches itself to this uh, interface. Um, so you can play around with it if you open Chrome with the remote debugging port, uh, port enabled. Um, and then you can, for instance, inspect a web application and um, open the inspector and then open another inspector to inspect what the inspector is doing, uh, which is really interesting to see what's going on because the, web the DevTools web application uh, is nothing else than uh, something written with HTML and JavaScript. Um, yeah, the way how Chrome Driver works, I have prepared a demo. Um, on the left side, I uh, started a Chrome driver. It's called CRMAX driver here. Why that is, I'm going to tell you in a second. Uh, but let's run a Selenium test, or not a Selenium test, just run, just start uh, Chrome with WebDriver O using the WebL functionality. And if we go up, we will see that um, the Chrome driver will receive the capabilities for your test, and then it will start um, Chrome with the remote debugging port, uh, port enabled. And it waits a while until Chrome is started. It tries to connect to the DevTools interface. Once that happened, it receives a lot of information about the page, what kind of page that is. And also interesting to see, it uh, will enable the um, domains that it needs uh, in order to run certain commands. So let's say we run, we want to get the URL of the page. Um, and the way Chrome driver is giving you that information is by calling runtime evaluate, which is uh, similar to what you do in WebDriver, calling execute. And it injects a script that would return exactly the uh, information that you would need. So the more Selenium approach. On the other side, if you do go ahead and be like, all right, I want to query the body uh, and want to click on it, you can interestingly see that where does it start? It fetches the element. Um, you see the body there. And then it tries to find out how, what the size of this element is, where it is located on the page. And at the end, it will emulate three different, um, three different events on the browser directly, on the engine itself, uh, which is it moves to the uh, center of the element uh, right here, um, presses it, mouse move to zero, and press on this position, and then releases the mouse. And there you have, then you have a click right there. When we look at the WebDriver protocol now, you, we won't see that many opportunities or commands that, we, that are available. Um, you just see a handful for, every, for, for getting element information for doing certain actions. And the reason why that is, is that um, the um, first idea of Selenium and WebDriver was that you can run an idealized browser. 
Um, everything that a user could do while he's experienced the web page, you should do with WebDriver, but nothing more. Uh, it should be simple. Um, however, um, the time when the JSON Wire protocol was created um, in 2006 or maybe earlier, I'm not sure, um, everything, every web page was created not with, with not much JavaScript. Everything went over the wire. So if you would uh, submit a form, uh, the page would get rendered on the server side, in, and you would not send just a JavaScript uh, a, a request up to the server and get the response you need. You'd get the whole HTML page. And at that time, all these commands would be sufficient enough. But these days, I think it would be good if we would have more uh, access to the uh, browser internals to do stuff like test coverage or performance testing. Um, therefore, I have another demo prepared. Um, this is a HTML page, super simple. Um, it has a script tag where some JavaScript is executed. And you don't, don't need, need to know much about coding and to see that this console log will probably never be called, because if is always false. Um, same for style. Uh, we, have an, we have a body element. We have a diff element. But there is no element that has a class foobar. So I've written a test that will give me the test coverage for JavaScript. And let me, um, perfect. Uh, what is that? Oh, I'm not in the right folder. All right, again. So it would um, create a static server that would serve the page. Then the browser would go to this page and would close immediately. Um, and you see exactly um, the, the code that is not going to be executed. The test is fairly simple. Um, all you need is enable the domains that you need. And the, the CMX driver I, um, called, uh, I, I talked about earlier, uh, it is a wrapper around Chrome driver um, that is built in a way that I can directly access the DevTools protocol uh, with uh, WebDriver, with Selenium. Um, so instead of executing this piece of probably JavaScript, um, it would exactly, it, it would try to find out if this is an actual domain of the protocol and would execute it on the browser directly. So I would start taking the test coverage, and um, then I would just take the test coverage at that certain point, and the rest of the test is just a little bit data massaging um, that I do. Another nice, the same would work for uh, CSS. Uh, another nice example would be, we could use the DevTools protocol to intercept certain requests on the browser. Um, if we change JavaScript on our web app, we don't necessarily want, need to have to test the API again, because you know, nev nothing has changed on the API level. Um, uh, the DevTools protocol allows us to intercept commands in the browser, and that would allow us to not have to deploy the whole, browser, the whole stack of your web application. Um, I prepared a test that instead of you know, mocking an API call, I mock an image on the Selenium Conf DE page. And instead of, it will start a browser and show the Selenium Conf DE page. Uh, how it is right now without modification. And then I reload the page. And instead of showing this nice hero image, uh, I'm just going to display uh, a cat, uh, which looks nice. Yeah, there's, there's a lot of other um, nice scenarios um, that I discovered that could be used uh, uh, leveraged using the DevTools protocol. Um, um, yeah. But let's talk about HPV TV. Um, this standard was created uh, five years ago. Um, there's already a driver for Appium, uh, actually, uh, that can run tests on a smart TV. However, HPV TV is an approach to bring um, applications to the smart TV on, on all manufacturers on a native level. So within the last couple of years, all, your smart, all the TVs that you can buy became quite connected to the internet, right? You, can, you could buy these setup boxes, uh, smart TV sticks, uh, or game consoles, and all these devices would allow you to create some sort of enhanced experience with your smart TV. The problem with that, though, is um, if you wanted to build an app that would work on all these um, platforms, you would have to write an app in Java, in whatnot, in all, on all these frameworks. And that is pretty um, exhausting. So what HPE TV does is, for all these current available um, smart TV op uh, operation systems, um, 
it defines a standard that would allow you to write a web application that would run on these uh, smart TVs. It is an Etsy standard. Um, and um, the first standard was created, or the first version was um, rolled out in 2010. And back then, it would allow you to write an app that um, allows you to write JavaScript um, that has ECMAScript 3 support uh, with a subset of HTML called CE HTML, Consumer Electronics. Um, and that would mean if you want to write an app, you would have to write an app that has to work on an IE5. Uh, so this is pretty outdated. Um, after, like, two years ago, HBTV 1.5 was released. Um, that hasn't really changed anything on that. Uh, but the last year, HBTV 2.1 finally allowed us to write apps using HTML5 and CSS3, um, which is exciting. So this is how an app looks like in Hello World application. Uh, you see um, CE HTML is an XML-based um, subset. Uh, what, what is important here is that you have a content type that says it is HBB TV, and you have an object element here that gives you access to the native TV interfaces. Um, what you usually do is you have an init function that would call the uh, application logic, and in there you would uh, query this object, and this would give you the JavaScript APIs that you need to, for instance, show your application. It is currently rolled out only in Europe, mainly in Europe. Um, other countries are considered to get rolled out. Um, I hope it will be rolled out on the whole um, world eventually and would allow us to write apps for smart TVs as well. Um, but we might get there. Um, there are two different types of um, HPV TV application. They are the ones that can be downloaded over the App Store. But that doesn't mean that everyone can write an, TV, uh, an app for the smart TV right now. Um, to get your app in your app store, you have to talk to the browser, uh, to, the, to the manufacturer like Philips or Samsung um, to get it there. The most used HPV TV application are broadcast related. That means you uh, turn on a channel on your TV and it would pop up, like, there would be a small notification saying, hey, this broadcaster provides an HPV TV experience for you. And then you can press the red button on the TV and it gives you, uh, it would display the app on the broadcast stream. The way how you today receive um, um, the broadcast uh, stream is you have a broadcaster, your smart TV at home, and I know in Germany there are at least uh, three different um, types of how you can receive it via uh, terrestrial, satellite, and cable. And with the introduction of HPV TV, the broadcaster also sends an AET package, which, which, is, um, which means application information table. And that one contains the name of the broadcaster and the URL of uh, the HPV TV that is somewhere deployed on AWS or where, where else. And the TV would go ahead and would download that app from the internet and would display it right on, on top of the screen. This is an example of the first uh, channel in Germany. Um, you see on the, right, on the bottom right, um, there will be this notification saying, hey, press the right button, and you see the app um, to see this HBU TV app. And then you can you know, scroll through their offers and, for instance, open the video on demand section, and that would allow you to just watch certain videos um, on demand. And it would replace the actual broadcast stream with the video that you choose um, on the app. Uh, similar for the second channel, that uh, isn't any different. Um, another interesting example or use case here is the um, companion screen. Um, you can build an app on your tablet that can interact with the application on your on the, with the HPV TV application on the TV, and this gives you the opportunity to show certain content that is connected to what you see on the TV. Uh, some applications, for instance, allow you to switch the language of the current running broadcast or the movie that you are watching. But yeah, if you write HPV TV application today, you will probably end up like me in uh, such rooms like this, uh, where there's just tons of TVs, uh, tons of uh, remote controls. Um, and since there are five different operation systems that all have different browsers, 
proprietary browsers. I know some work with the Presto engine that was used with Opera. A lot of them use WebKit, but they're still kind of proprietary, and you, don't, you never know what is supported and what not. Um, so they, the, the founder of Focus called me in and wanted to write an automation driver so they can run their, uh, test their apps on CI and um, CD. Um, and they didn't want to look like this guy, um, having a co remote control and uh, you know, clicking around. That's just a horrible job. So I sat, sat down and was looking at how Selenium and WebDriver evolved over the years. And I didn't want to create something that is completely new. I wanted to leverage what already exists um, in a good way. Um, so the first thing that I've written is called DevTools Backend. The DevTools Backend is a proxy server that um, can inject a script into a uh, target environment and would allow you to access the DevTools Backend server using any kind of um, Chrome DevTools application um, or anything that speaks the Chrome DevTools protocol. Um, for instance, you can start the server, you can set up an HTTP proxy on Firefox, and this would allow you to use Chrome and the Chrome DevTools application to debug uh, Firefox. The way it works is the proxy would try to figure out what kind of content is loaded, and if there's an HTML page or an HPV TV page, it would inject an instrumentation script on the page. And the instrumentation script um, is um, speaking the DevTools protocol language, basically. And um, that would allow you to just use all the commands that I showed you before um, uh, with any kind of client. You can use the DevTools client. You could, for instance, also use um, um, uh, is your, your development IDE to debug certain things there. The way it works is that you have your in instrumentation script injected on your target environment, and it speaks to a backend to a server. Um, and then you can attach to this server using a DevTools client. And you'd be like, OK, I want to use this DOM domain in order to do something. Uh, the server would respond, OK, got it enabled. Go ahead with the next command. And then you could call it get document, for instance, to that is what the DevTools application uses to show you the DOM tree of your web application. And it would go down to the instrumentation script, and the instrumentation script would return a JSON object that, is, that represents the current DOM tree. Um, it has a node name, frame IDs, all that fun stuff that is documented on the protocol. And that I used, combined with a Raspberry Pi, um, to debug an HP TV, TV application or live on the TV. Um, I was actually all these you know, broadcasts that don't want you um, to, to debug it in the way. Um, that's why there are no native interfaces for that. Um, so it was for me the first time or the first time ever that someone was uh, actually able to experience or to look into what the application actually looked like. So next to the elements panel that I reverse engineered and the CSS panel, um, I also, using some monkey patching, was able to capture all the console logs and console errors. I listened to all the error events to, to throw that in the um, uh, console tab. And I was also able to just run any kind of JavaScript that I wanted to do um, on the target environment on the TV. And since it is a proxy, um, I was able to just check what kind of requests are made by the uh, smart TV. Uh, kind of a security concern. Many people don't know what the TV is actually having, uh, like what kind of informa information the TV has about you. Is the camera enabled? Does they, do they send, you know, yourself watching TV to the broadcaster. Um, you never know that, um, but with that, uh, you can actually see what's, what's going on under the hood. So then I only need to write something that would, um, similar to the Chrome driver, translate everything that, um, translate every web driver request into a Chrome DevTools re uh, request and send it to the target environment to operate on it. That's what I built with the HPU TV driver. The HPU TV driver has the DevTools backend as a dependency. It, can, it uses it. It starts the proxy automatically. And um, you, you, if you request a session, it would make sure that the instrumentation script is injected in order to 
be able to do any operations. If not, you would have to press the exit button, which would reload the HPTV app. So once you have access, once the driver has access to the page, it would return your session ID. And with that session ID, you can, of course, call any web driver command. And the Appium HPV driver then translates, for instance, the source command into a DOM get outer HTML. And that would be sent to the instrumentation script on the TV. And uh, it returns the, the string, the HTML um, DOM tree as a string. And since Appium already comes with a lot of uh, useful packages that helps you write a driver that is conformed to the web driver spec, um, you just need to return it, and you have a proper web driver response. So I, I was sitting then in the TV lab and hooked every TV up with a Raspberry Pi. And that Raspberry Pi was my proxy. So the TV was connected to the Raspberry Pi and the Raspberry Pi to the internet. So every, every internet connection or any request that the TV is doing goes through my proxy server. And I was able to inject my instrumentation script at any given point in time. I then renamed the host name of each Raspberry Pi to be the model name of the TV, so I, was, I didn't have to figure out which TV um, is what IP address. And then I enhanced the Appium um, driver to just have a form that would allow me to connect to a, a Selenium grid. Um, thanks to the uh, user agent, I was already able to fulfill the capabilities. And this time, in this case, it is um, an LG smart TV. Um, and with that, I, could, I was able to run a test, an HB TV test, um, in parallel in this TV lab um, using the Selenium grid um, with a just random uh, web, driver, uh, web driver client. So usually, those kind of tests um, run through the app and make sure that stuff like videos play uh, properly. Um, because the videos have to be formatted in a specific way that you never know if it's supported or not. So a usual test looks like this. Um, this is written in RepDriver in Node.js. Um, it doesn't look different than any other test on the desktop, with one big difference, though. If you look at the page object, um, usually when you test your web application using Chrome or any, any browser, you can query an element and do an, an action on it, like clicking or whatnot. With smart TVs, your only input device is a remote control, right? So in order to get to some point, you need to do click, 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 uh, so left, 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 or in this case, down, 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 and press Enter uh, to open a new page, um, which can be difficult when you don't know where you're at. But you can always reload the page to get to a certain start point again. And yeah, since it is a just standard um, web driver client, uh, could be any, uh, I, could, I was able to hook up um, any kind of reporter that I want to um, and just have, it, um, have my test uh, running in a CI CD system, um, having reports that, say, that tell me how good my tests are running uh, and all that sort of things. All right, so some key takeaways here. Um, I really recommend everyone that is, that is writing uh, uh, Selenium tests on a regular basis to, to make sure that you understand the underlying uh, automation technology. This really helps you to figure out where the error of your test is actually um, lying. Uh, so some people come to me and be like, um, this error message that is thrown by a Chrome driver or another driver, and they, they blame it on, on WebDriver.io, for instance, and, and be like, I, I just can't send the request that the web driver spec is telling me. Um, and if you, if you know what's going on on the hood a little bit better, then you might better understand where you can fix um, the problems in your test. Of course, reading source code is always a good idea. Um, uh, it helped a lot to, to go to the Chrome driver um, code in order to figure out how I can multiplex the connection to the Chrome. Um, there's, a, there's an old bug in the WebKit engine that only allows you to connect to the DevTools protocol with one client. But if you create a multiplexer that would connect to Chrome and would allow multiple incoming messages, um, you can easily just um, work around that issue um, and use the DevTools protocol in your test like I showed before. 
And of course, uh, contribution, contribution is king. Uh, contribute to the landing project or to any, any other clients that are out there. Um, that helps a lot to you know, get yourself familiar with the whole uh, topic. With that being said, um, thank you so much for your attention. Um, I hope I see, if you have questions, uh, let me know. And I hope we have a beer later today on the Oktoberfest. Thank you.